So we have about 30 to 40 cassowaries. We thought we had about 12. Now we know that we have a lot more because we are measuring them. Um, we're, people are very much more aware. We now have a central place that people can call into and say, I've seen a cassowary. So we can work out whether it's the same one that we've seen before or whether it's a, it's a new one. Um, so that's helped us put together a lot of information. So that's allowed us to feed into the WildNet uh, database which is a national database and uh, it will show all the cassowaries that we have in the region and we've given them names and the community is involved in this. The community, uh, somebody who sees the cassowary is given the option to name the cassowary so that gives them some sense of ownership and involvement. So that's all good um, and we uh, are able to, to track the cassowaries and that the issue that we now have <coughs> is the cassowary um, chicks are coming in year by year and uh, we need now to track them as well. And they're so unidentifiable because they all look exactly the same um, and it's very hard to actually track them. Um, and it can be a very dangerous time to their most vulnerable at that time. So, uh, but we need to find out a way of doing that to see how many survive, how many don't, and why. And uh, so that we can um, get a bit of a foundation, a baseline, if you like, of how many categories there are in the, the, the greater Coranda region. Yes, <clears throat> I think for any sort of mapping that we do on an environmental scale, uh, we need to work with the baselines that are laid down by nature. So they are uh, mountain ranges and that makes rivers and creeks and gullies and the, another fundamental uh, piece of information is soil type because you have rainforest in some soil types and you have different soil in uh, Spiwa, for instance, where you have the ecotone is very noticeable and very rich because it has a wide variety of, community, of um, environmental values, uh, and the soil changes. So the soil changes that gives us the rainforest growth, um, and then it changes to a different sort of soil that can't grow rainforest. It grows better the uh, sclerophyll, uh, the eucalypt type forest and the grasslands uh, and where though that junction appears uh, then that's where it's very rich because you have all the animals on both sides of the, the environmental type. And a, a very good example of that is if you walk on the, from Wright's Lookout to Surprise Creek and you'll be walking through rainforest um, and, it, and it's, it's rich and lush and we've seen cassowaries up there crossing the, crossing the track, it's a little track and then you go a little bit further and then it starts to change and it's more grassland and the trees are sparser and they're a different sort of tree right down until you get to the river and then it changes again back down at the river. And it, if you're with somebody who knows what to look for, you can see the line where the soil changes from the dark rainforest soil to the white, sandy, uh, orangey clay. Uh, and you can see the line and you can see the vegetation change. So that's how stark it, it can be. So these are the, um, the laws, if you like, that are laid down by nature. So we have soil types, we have rivers, and we have vegetation types that depend somewhat on those original things. So um, when we're trying to work out uh, what we need to save and what, where we need connections, then follow, let's follow our creeks, our rivers and creeks. And th there are rivers and creeks on an awful lot of private land, and if we can make arrangements with the landholders that these particular creeks 
um, are connections between uh, rainforest at one end of it and along the way of it, then I can't think of a better way to say, well, this is where we need to have our vegetation, this is what we need to revegetate. So there are connection points that connect gelatin with Spiwa and beyond. I mean, that's, that's a huge area. But there are, are tracks uh, and creeks all the way along there that would connect up very well. We chose the cassowary as our symbol because we were working on the understanding that if you get it right for the cassowary, then you get it right for everything else. So um, if you've got an environment that will support a cassowary, then you necessarily have an environment that will, report, will support frogs and insects and um, paddy melons and musky rat kangaroos and even tree kangaroos. So that was why we thought if we get it right for the cassowary, we get it right for everything else. So our nursery, uh, we make sure that everything we grow in the nursery um, will satisfy that criterion, that it's good for the, the cassowary and related wildlife. So we grow lots of food trees for the cassowaries. Our prices only support our ability to buy more potting mix and whatever it else we need to operate with. We don't um, have uh, we don't have a profit margin, we just need to support our activity. Because we, we don't do it for money, we do it for love. We just want people to get native plants into their backyards and onto their properties. And they will be then satisfying this criterion of if it's right for the cassowary. So that's where, that's our fundamental philosophy. In terms of uh, planning, town planning, we've always thought was a, a, of fundamental importance. The lie of the land and uh, what you do in certain places on the land. Um, unfortunately, going back, if there was anybody who had a large tract of land that was suitable for subdividing, then it was all to do with... Uh, building houses and uh, infrastructure and that sort of thing. And we really have to get past that um, because it's not endless. We've got to the end of endless. We are now somewhere where we're on the decline. We, we need to uh, claw back some of those things that we thought that went on forever and we didn't have to worry about. So uh, we now only have left 25% of the original habitat before we came along and started to take it and use it. And there's more and more of us taking more and more of the land and the resources and there's less and less for the animals. We keep on pushing them back. Well, they'll just go further up the road or something like that. But no, cassowaries, for instance, need a large tract of land. They need square kilometres to range in to get enough food to fill that enormous belly um, at all times of the year, and then their chicks and so on. So um, that's why we need to uh, be part of planning, and not we need to get ahead of the game, and not waiting for town plans to say, oh, well, these are the rules. We've got to start making the rules for town planning making the rules now with the environment in mind because we weren't doing that. We thought the environment was endless. Sorry, we've gone too far. We now need to claw it back. Uh, we now need to plan around our environment. So our environment is taking some of the space that we felt, thought we had an inalienable right to. We don't. Um, and we're now realising that. Um, in cities, you don't have cassowaries wandering around. You don't have lots of little animals wandering around. Why? They've all been pushed back by concrete and bricks. 
and uh, dogs and cats uh, and our animals. And then further afield, we've put uh, uh, cattle and sheep on vast tracts of land. None of those things should be there. But we never thought of that. Now, at the 11th hour, we have to start thinking about those things um, to eke it out for as long as we can. Um, the big question, of course, is human numbers. Uh, it, it still has to be recognised that that's, that's really the root of the problem. We are the root of the problem. So uh, we also have some intelligence, and with that intelligence, we ought to be able to make better decisions uh, because we understand better now what we have. Um, it's like the thing, uh, no more parking lots. Uh, we've got to think of how we are going to lead our lives so in tune with the environment, not the other way around. We've just been taking the environment for ourselves. Now we've got to start working in tune with it. Um, that goes with lots of the things that we sort of think are bugs that we don't like that we think snakes are scary, um, that um, we think cassowaries are dangerous. No, none of those things. They were here first. Absolutely they can. Um, there, there is a, an, another thing of conjecture that I could talk about that I feel we need to talk about and not put our heads in the sand. There is this uh, a strong uh, rule that's been don't feed wildlife, don't feed cassowaries. We've taken so much of their environment now and we've squashed them further and further into small places. They're coming into their backyards because we took that away from them. Now, and we, if we plant a whole lot of uh, exotic type plants that don't belong here, we're taking away from the natural environment all the things that the native uh, animals would would feed on. If we are going to keep cassowaries, uh, first of all we must not take any more of their habitat. Secondly, we've taken so much that I'm saying, and I'll get into trouble for this, that we probably need to feed our cassowaries. Then the question is, what and how? And the what is you feed them their natural foods. Now there are other things that are not their natural foods like pawpaws and bananas. Uh, they're, they're all exotic things that have been introduced. But cassowaries thrive on those and they seem to do very well. You don't feed them pineapples, for instance. That's not very good, that's very bad. And you definitely don't feed them avocados, that'll kill them. So there, there are some things about what. And you definitely don't feed them leftover pizza anything to do with yeast or bread. Don't feed any wildlife with those sorts of things. And uh, I think people think, oh, I'll throw the scraps out for the wildlife. The way that you can feed cassowaries is by planting the right food, food in your properties. And if you're going to feed them in any other way, it should be food from heaven. This is the how you feed them. So if you get the what you feed them right, then how you feed them is not out of a plate, not out of a bu bucket. You don't throw the food to them. Uh, they need to find the food without relating it to the fact that the human has put it there. So if it appears under a tree that they get other fruit from and it's the right sort of food and you're sub uh, subsidising their, um, their diet, then I can't believe that that's all wrong. Mm. Uh, yes, one of the things that we need to do is build corridors, linkages, that connect up good pockets of rainforest from one place to another. Now, some of these places can go over roads, through creeks, through people's private property and all of that. We need to get beyond worrying about those sorts of things. We need to build our roads so that there are overpasses or underpasses for wildlife. They don't have to go across the road. Yes, it's more expensive, but it's about time we started paying back to the environment instead of constantly borrowing it from it. You know, it's, it's pay-up time. Um, and asking uh, property owners 
um, if they could at least sacrifice a small section of their land a hundred metres across or something like that. Uh, that could be planted out with natural native food so that animals like cassowaries can pass through the land. And then you can do everything else that you want to on part of it, but you don't have to take all of it for your own benefit. And one of the best criteria, I think, for choosing the area that you might be is uh, creeks, following, following creeks. If we can follow creeks um, and, and rivers and make our corridors following that uh, and also linking up with good vegetation along the way, I think we'll be doing a good thing. When we're doing that now, <clears throat> under our program called uh, Connecting Cassowary Corridors, and we're doing it on private land because the people have invited us to come and do that on their land. Uh, we're doing it in cassowary countries, country where we know that cassowaries have been in the past and enriching the land uh, with good cassowary food trees. And that means wildlife food trees. And they can have short growing ones or large growing ones or don't plant here but do plant here. Thank you, that's great, we can do that. And they help and they look after it and keep things humming along. And if we do it, seeing that nearly all the land is privately owned, mm -hmm. if we work with the private landholders, then I think that that's our best course of success. We now know that we've really tried to um, form this database and have a central point is that we now know that they go as far out as Closey, because um, that is in rainforest area, not so much in Coa, because that's already morphed into the dry sclerophyll country, where you might find an emu or two, but not a cassowary. So uh, they range from the Closey area right down to the, mount the mountains near the airport down there, that uh, the last cassowary was seen there, but it is still cassowary country. The last cassowary was taken by dogs. Um, one of the things that has improved, I'm sorry I divert here because okay. uh, the reason that we lost that cassowary was uh, dogs and I think there has been such uh, um, an awareness now that there are only some people who have these large dogs that they let go for a run in the forest uh, at the end of the day, because they've been locked up all day or something, um, I think there are less and less and more and more people reporting on them. Thank you. We need you to report on them. We need those people to be um, drawn to heal. Absolutely. So you can have your pet, but your pet cat needs to be always within a container. Uh, that can be a nice container outside where it has access to the outside bush, but it needs to be contained so it can't go wild in the bush. Dogs need to always be taken for a walk on a lead. If you haven't the time or the energy to walk your dog on a lead, don't have a dog. And if you want a guard dog, then the guard dog needs to be <laughs> contained within the fence. And now fences are a great barrier to uh, movement of wildlife. So one of the things residents can do if they want to have um, animals uh, other non-native animals on their properties, they could fence off their areas where they want to keep the animals and leave the the connecting part, the part that they are revegetating, and we're happy to help with that, um, leaving that unfenced so the animals can get through. It's absolutely unbelievable to me that uh, you would have barbed wire fencing is is like putting knives all all around. Uh, you know, like prisons with, with razor wire. And yet we've done that with our cattle, to stop our cattle getting out. But we stop our animals moving, our wildlife moving through, especially large wildlife. Um, even wild pigs, which we don't want, uh, can move through that. But cassowaries can't. Um, it's very difficult for them to bend down and go underneath something. Occasionally they can. They can't step over the top of it. Um, so it's a real barrier to have barbed wire fencing anywhere. One of the uh, surveys that we need to follow up on 
is going through our uh, corridors where we perceive that there is a corridor and uh, checking it out for um, uh, um, barbed wire fences or fences of any sort. If it's development as we've always done it, it means the end of the line. It's only going to be what I call uh, the baked bean syndrome. You'll have nothing but people and what people do. And, and, and you can see that in cities. Now, we have the opportunity of doing something a little bit more than that. We have a, a wonderful environment that we keep on nibbling away at. Uh, every time someone with money comes along and they want to do a subdivision, then councils bow to that. One of the rules that's got to change in our town planning is this 10-year rule that there was something that was okay 10 years ago and if you get in by the 31st of July, uh, you can still do that. No, the reason that the plan has changed 10 years ago and you can't do it anymore is because it's no longer appropriate, that we've woken up to ourselves that we can't do this anymore. And yet, someone with money comes along and they magically can. So that's something that we've definitely got to change in our town, town planning rules. That when you can't do something, if it's something you've started, you can finish it, but you can't start it again. You can't have the um, uh, Barnwell, the Kerwell type of arrangement that you can come back and wreck everything that we know. We changed the law because it couldn't be wrecked. And then it's, oh, it's all right, yes, you've got money, so therefore you can do that. We've got to change the expectation. That's changing the law. So that on a certain date, after that, you don't have the expectation that you can go back there and uh, do something that was okay 10 years ago. Well, it wasn't, but we thought it was uh, 10 years ago, and you can have another go. No. So that's, I can't believe that rule. Uh, we've got to get beyond that. That is a very, not a very clever solution to how we should move forward. Uh, we know we know too much now. We can't do that anymore. So following these rules that we're trying to lay down now is following creeks and rivers. Uh, if we use that, then it's a very good way of connecting up things and saying, on this land that has been cleared, it needs to be revegetated re in any gullies and creeks and whether they're uh, seasonal or not and, and river banks, right through to another connection, another connection until we get to the World Heritage Area again or good rainforested area that is protected in some way, National Park or whatever. So I think that's the way we've got to look at it now and that's got to be written into our rules so that developers come along and they have an expectation that they are not going to be able to uh, clear the whole lot. It's only regrowth. We need regrowth. Uh, regrowth is recovery. We need the recovery um, and you won't be able to do any development along the creeks and gullies that are the connecting veins of this whole thing, the arteries. The term is about 30 years. Right. I think okay. it's about 30 years. Um, and by that time, uh, trees are growing, fruiting, um, reproducing, you know, the whole thing is, is, is happening. Yeah. Um, and that once a tree, after about five to ten years, is fruiting, that's food for animals. Oh, totally it is. And if we keep on having subdivisions for the sake of, of someone making money, uh, then we're just going to continue down that road. Now, does it matter in Sydney and Melbourne anymore? I mean, it's all paved. It does matter up here. We're in the World Heritage Area up here. We have an opportunity to rescue and make better this place, not keep on taking it until we've taken everything to the very edge of the World Heritage Area because you can't go in there, or a national park, you can't go in there. We don't want this rigid line of, oh, this is protected, and on the side of the, uh, the other side of the barbed wire fence, it's not protected. No, we need to get phasing through to pockets of development. Now, councils agree 
that pockets of development are efficient use of land. It may be that we should be having flats and high rise in the urban parts of Karanda and leaving the other parts. You know, we're talking about people here and people are not, people take, they don't give. We're not, we have to contain ourselves. Somehow we have to modify our habits of living so that uh, the other parts of the planet can also thrive. It's not all about people. So people uh, in, in flats, in uh, concentrations, uh, is probably the way to go. Then they can go for a lovely walk in the forest if they like. So um, good public services. Yes, yeah, yes. I agree. We've got to stop our feeling that we've got to have dogs and cats and all of that. People have to give up something and we're very slow to give up anything. I'm a person, I'm at the top of the food chain, so therefore I can do anything. And we are doomed for as long as that attitude prevails. Somebody uh, in, in Paris has, doesn't like bugs, bought a block of land and has cleared everything within their fence line, within their barbed wire fence line. Um, and uh, because she doesn't like snakes and things like that and creepy crawlies. Why did a person like that buy land in a place like that? How can we prevent that sort of mentality of coming into places like that? How can we stop the townies who don't like the mosquitoes or the, or the lizards or the snakes or something from buying and ruining land that is supporting her breathing? <laughs> you know, it's as fundamental as that. It's providing air for her to breathe. And she's depending on all her neighbours uh, to have that nice environment around while she's protected. Mm. Uh, so somehow or other, and that's where I think we get back to the town planning, that when a subdivision is happening in a place like that, and it never should happen in a place like that, um, but there will still be times when uh, subdivisions will happen in places like that, the, the, the rules have to be such that it does not attract that sort of person. You may not cut down any trees. You may only have a fence around your immediate house. You may only have a small driveway uh, and you may not clear any other land than that. And if you do, we'll find you large amounts of money so that we can rehabilitate that land. I think that it's councils that have got to set their town planning so that if you want to uh, develop in this area where there is some high quality environmental values, then you may only do this and this and this and this and this. And if you think that that's not value for money, then don't come and, and subdivide in this place. Unfortunately, uh, cleared land is a great magnet for uh, development. Well, it's already cleared. Um, and we've got to get past that and we've got to say, yes, it's already cleared, but it shouldn't have been and we need to rehabilitate the creeks and gullies. And if we can say that, we're going somewhere towards uh, rehabilitating and there is some space for some development uh, around the school. The school, in my mind, was uh, badly placed because it didn't take into account that there was bound to be a residential development in a place where there shouldn't be residential development because a lot of clearing had already happened. We're still making that mistake. Um, however, we now have a school there. We're now going to have to uh, be aware that there's going to be some development happening there. So we can have that development in, in areas around there as long as we follow our creeks and as long as we build our roads so that wildlife can get above or below it and don't have to go onto it. You know, it's got to be money spent. Can't get away, can't keep on taking away from the environment. Um, so there is room for us to continue to, to develop and thinking of ways of concentrating our developments and not spreading out. We spread out an awful lot and uh, we put up our barbed wire fences.
So the carrying capacity of this place and, and those areas that I've outlined as being cassowary habitat, uh, really, we're at its carrying capacity now. It's, we, there's very little that we can do without um, Im impacting on the natural environment that we have. We actually need the large blocks with an occasional house here and there because, uh, and we shouldn't be trying to maintain it, we should be just letting it go. We shouldn't have fences, we shouldn't have dogs and cats. Uh, we should, uh, an occasional house dotted through is probably the human carrying capacity of this area. I think we've exceeded it already. The money god is still talking the loudest. It, it talks louder than the environment. You know, I've got a bulldozer because I've got the money to have one. I can knock down those trees. And that's, there was another block of land that uh, somebody bulldozed down wall to wall. Um, and I uh, said, why did they do that? Because they have bulldozers. That, that's right, there is sneaky clearing that's going on all the time. So I think the areas that we should be focusing on is changing the rules. Uh, to make, because I think that's the bottom line. And there are some rules like this 10 year rule that you can, can't, you can do it in 10 years time. It's absolutely ridiculous nonsense, which is why we have the Kerwell situation where we shouldn't have the Kerwell situation. Um, we need to plan better for connecting corridors. Um, we have to modify our own lives. It's not all about people. We have to modify our own lives so that we sacrifice a bit for the environment. Can't take any more. Um, we're at the end of that. It's time now to leave it alone. And we've got to fit into the bigger picture, which is the environmental picture. Uh, yes, but I have to go back one step further. The laws. Uh, the private land owners uh, are able to do an awful lot of stuff. Um, there need to be some laws that prevent some of that stuff, especially here. Mm. You know, as Bill Lawrence points out, uh, this is a World Heritage Area, and even the bits that aren't in the World Heritage Area have World Heritage values, Wet Tropics World Heritage values. So um, landholders don't have to adhere to that if they've already cleared their land. Uh, we now need to be bringing in some rules that say you need now to rehabilitate those creekways. If we can, if we can just stick to that, if we can just rehabilitate and have large areas on each side of our creeks that we can't go into and we can't develop. We'll be making good inroads into clawing back some of the connect connectivity that we need because we are lucky enough to have areas that are worth connecting up.